a male in his 20s, presents the ED with fever, cough, diarrhea and abdominal pain and has an AP chest x-ray. In this case, there are some really important learning points that could help you going forward. What's the diagnosis? Let's go through the case. Here we have a young patient who is having an AP film and ED recess, so we know they are likely to be sick. We can see several nodules within the right lung, mainly within the middle and lower zones. Some of these are quite peripheral. With multiple lung nodules and an unwell young male, what are the main differentials? In a young sick patient, we have to consider septic pulmonary emboli. Here there is an infection elsewhere that embolizes to the lungs via the pulmonary arterial system. The two main findings on imaging are small cavitating nodules that tend to be peripheral. These are thought to result from septic occlusion of small peripheral pulmonary arterial branches. Secondly, we can see peripheral wedge-shaped opacities resulting from infarction. The pulmonary arteries we can see on CT tend to look normal, unlike standard PE, which can also lead to wedge-shaped opacities caused by infarction. Lung metastases are a possibility, although wouldn't really account for the clinical picture. It's not common to see lung metastases in a patient of this age, but some tumours that affect people in their 20s, like testicular tumours and osteosarcoma, can metastasize to the lung. We certainly need to think about a first presentation of a vasculitis, namely granulomatous polyangitis, formerly known as Wegener's granulomatosis. We commonly see these patients present with hemoptysis, and on imaging can see nodules as we've seen here, as well as pulmonary hemorrhage and peripheral wedge-shaped opacities, so this could fit. An infection could account for the clinical picture. Presentation with discrete large lung nodules on imaging isn't a typical presentation, but could be seen with certain organisms such as Aspergillus. Lastly, we have rheumatoid nodules, which doesn't fit the age profile, with rheumatoid usually presenting after the age of 30, but some forms can affect younger patients. There can be small peripheral nodules, however, rheumatoid wouldn't account for the clinical presentation we have here. On the subsequent CT scan, we can see some peripheral small discrete nodules as well as some wedge-shaped regions that show what we call a reverse halo appearance, also known as the atoll sign. An atoll is a ring-shaped island surrounding water, so obviously radiologists took that to mean consolidation surrounding ground glass opacity within a lesion on a CT scan, because they are exactly the same thing. There is a differential for reverse halo, including lung infarction, and this can be seen in septic emboli, which at this point was now the number one differential. Whenever you see what you think may be septic emboli on a CT scan, it's important to hunt for the source. Indwelling catheters or infected cardiac prostheses can introduce organisms to the bloodstream, but there is no history of that here. It's worth checking for a heart murmur or performing an echo, as endocarditis, and in particular right-sided endocarditis, can lead to septic emboli. A history of intravenous drug use can also precipitate septic emboli, so if you have a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, you can check to see if there are any signs of thrombophlebitis within the groin. Soft tissue infections and abscesses can do it, so clinically expose and examine the patient and scrutinize the subcutaneous tissues on CT. Head and neck infections such as tonsillitis are another possible cause, so asking the patient about any of these symptoms can help. In this case, the possibility of septic emboli was raised by the reporting radiologist and the clinical team was asked to find a source. On questioning, the patient reported a history of a sore throat in the week before getting very unwell. An ultrasound of the internal jugular vein was performed looking for thrombus, and here we can see a large clot within the internal jugular vein, meaning we can now make a diagnosis of Lemierre syndrome. In Lemierre syndrome, there is a thrombophlebitis of the internal jugular vein, usually in the setting of a bacterial head and neck infection, such as pharyngitis or tonsillitis, which then leads to a septicemia and you can get septic emboli within the lungs, as well as a septic arthritis within the large joints. This usually affects young patients in their teenage years or early 20s, and is usually treated with IV antibiotics and anticoagulants. Left untreated, this can have a high mortality rate. If we go back to the CT, we can see a pleural effusion on the left. This was tapped, confirming an empyema, which is a known complication of septic emboli. The patient got more unwell, requiring a number of chest strains which were inserted by radiologists. After a couple of weeks, however, the patient was able to leave hospital and a follow-up film shows an improvement in the lung opacities and bilateral pleural effusions. So what about the abdominal pain and diarrhea at presentation? It's worth recognising that a small number of septic pulmonary emboli cases can present with gastrointestinal disturbance like was seen here. Images of the abdomen acquired at the time of the initial CT didn't show an abnormality. Now this case is a really important one. What can help you here is that for young patients presenting with peripheral nodules and wedge-shaped opacities, make sure that you have septic emboli on your radar. 
And if the CT fits, hunt for a source as this could really help your patient.